So now we are gonna move into the uh, muscles of our upper extremity. But first I've got a question for you. What is the primary stabilizer of the glenohumeral joint? Now I know we already looked at this question, but I want you to take a look at it again and give us an answer. Good, so hopefully you remember it is the muscles. So we are looking at the muscles as being the primary stabilizer, very different than what we could see with the hip, uh, but we're gonna focus on some of these muscles. So whatever we are gaining from our lack of stability, remember we get to make up for with our mobility. So if the bone shape is not providing the stability, we are looking at some of it is the ligaments, but most of it is those rotator cuff muscles. So let's take a look at this rotator cuff area. So looking at our rotator cuff, here we have here four different muscles surrounding this glenohumeral joint. So we've got the supraspinatus, right, above the spine of the scapula. We have the infraspinatus, which is below the spine of the scapula. We've got the teres minor, and then those are the three that are on the posterior side. On the anterior side, we're gonna have the subscapularis tendon that you can see right here. So this is our subscapularis muscle that we have right here. So taking a look here on the anterior side, so if we were looking through the front of the person and looking through that rib cage, we would see the subscapularis. That's the one that we can see and it's attaching up here onto our trochanter right here, or excuse me, on the tuberosity right here. Then we take a look on the posterior side. Here we've got the supraspinatus that's coming through and attaching up on the top of the humerus. We've got the infraspinatus. Here's that spine of the scapula. So supra is above, infra is below. And then we've got the teres minor. Teres simply means that it's round and spindle-like. And so that's what it's describing is that shape that you can see right there. Now, when we look at it, there's really a delicate balance between the subscapularis and the infraspinatus that is really anchoring that humerus into the joint itself. So here we've got the humerus. Here we've got our glenoid cavity, right? And then we've got the subscapularis on the anterior side and the infraspinatus on the posterior side. And these two are really working to balance and keep pulling that humerus in towards the joint. So it's a really nice interplay between these two muscles. And you can see if I contract one, that's gonna end up rotating my humerus. And if I contract the other, it would rotate it in the opposite direction. We'll take a look at those movements in a minute. So there are occasional injuries that can happen to the rotator cuff. And in fact, um, they can be quite common as far as shoulder injuries go. So here, this is showing the shoulder cuff, uh, the rotator cuff tear. Um, usually when this is happening, it's typically happening in the supraspinatus where you're actually getting a tear in the muscle of the supraspinatus. So here you can see the muscle is actually intact. And then, well, you can see it's here, but then you're starting to see a little break right there. And then this is actually when it's kind of um, more emphasized with color in which you can actually see that there is a tear that is occurring within that supraspinatus. Now, how does this tend to happen? Why does this tend to happen? Well, here, when you take a look at it, we are looking at the motion of shoulder abduction, right? So the supraspinatus, um, right, uh, there we go, right here of what you can see is typically responsible for about the first 10% of abduction. So just raising up that arm a little bit, right? Then this muscle right here is going to take over and do the rest of it. So this is actually the deltoid. So the deltoid, and it's typically the middle section of it, um, you just need to know deltoid though, is the one that takes over for the supraspinatus after the supraspinatus does about the first 10%, maybe 15% of abduction. 
it puts a lot of strain on the supraspinatus to constantly be, it's a tiny muscle, right? To constantly be the one that is initiating the shoulder abduction. The, and it's, it's a very tight area that you can see it located in versus when you look at the deltoid, it's a meatier muscle and there isn't anything trapping it. So the deltoid is pretty robust as far as performing the shoulder abduction, but the supraspinatus is not so much. Um, it does do that first 10%, but you can see it could cause issues over time with contraction of that muscle in such a tight little area. And that's what we're gonna see right here. So here in picture A, you can see that we've got a very healthy supraspinatus that's right underneath the scapula that's coming up, the acromion, the, this is called the subacromion space, right below subacromion, the acromion, right, of the scapula. So we've got the subacromial space, and this is a very healthy supraspinatus. Over time, though, as we contract it and are putting constant contraction on that supraspinatus, you'll notice that it starts to thin out over time it can start to cause issues because it is getting impeded if say our uh, shoulders are kind of protracted forward, which is typically what we will find people in. Right now you're probably sitting with your, your scapula slightly protracted forward. So that's why we wanna emphasize good posture because it opens up this subacromial space that is what is impinging on this supraspinatus. As we continue, you can see it starts to wear so thin that ultimately in D, you can't even really see that supraspinatus because this is when the tear is starting to happen. So we're gonna actually take a look at a common injury that can lead towards this, which is called shoulder impingement. And I've got a few videos for us to watch just to kind of um, show you and demonstrate internally what is happening with shoulder impingement. Bone Break with Dr. Clayton Lane. The shoulder is different than any other joint in the body. While other joints have a deep cup analogous to a trailer hitch, the ball of the shoulder is more like a golf ball on a tee. This design allows free range of motion, making the shoulder the most versatile joint in the body. The downside is, is that it's also the most unstable joint in the body. To keep the ball from falling off the tee, the shoulder has a complex system of muscles called the rotator cuff, which through coordinated contractions keeps the ball within one millimeter of the center of the cup throughout the entire range of motion. Now with such a delicate balance, it's easy to see how a small injury or abnormality can quickly snowball into a bigger and bigger problem. Here we see the supraspinatus, one muscle in the cuff, whose job it is to push down on the ball as the deltoid pulls the arm up. When the supraspinatus is weak from injury, it allows the ball to slide up into the roof of the shoulder. This is called impingement, which causes pain with overhead activity and may result in tearing of the cuff. If you have an orthopedic question, email me at bonebreak at alortho.com. All right, and I've got one more for you on shoulder impingement. An impingement syndrome occurs at the shoulder when one of the rotator cuff tendons become pinched between the bones which form the shoulder joint. The tendon of supraspinatus is most commonly involved. Symptoms include pain, which comes on gradually and is worse when lifting the arm above shoulder height. Pain is also common on rotating the arm outwards. Impingement syndromes are overuse injuries which are usually related to poor upper back and shoulder posture as well as movement patterns. Forward rounded shoulders decreases the space available at the shoulder joint, causing one or more tendons to become trapped when the arm is raised. Repetitive pinching of a tendon can cause damage which causes inflammation and thickening of the tendon, making the problem worse. Treatment of an impingement syndrome include resting, from aggravating activities and correcting the postural factors such as tight chest muscles and weak upper back muscles. Strengthening the rotator cuff muscles will also promote shoulder stability. For more information, visit sportsinjuryclinic.net. So when we look at it, we realize that we cannot diagnose, right? We cannot diagnose that somebody has shoulder impingement, but it is important for us to understand how that body is working when they are exhibiting signs and symptoms of shoulder impingement and maybe even have that diagnose from a physical therapist or a doctor. 
right? And now we looked at it of what happens when we are non-weight bearing and instead just doing free movement with the shoulder. And you can see that that small space can start to impede even more. Now imagine if we actually had weight added onto that and we were doing heavier lifting, right? This is why form when we are lifting and just in general posture wise is so incredibly important, right? When we look at it, it's actually very interesting because the if, if you had to take a guess of what occupation suffers from shoulder impingement the most, I'm curious on what occupation you would say it is. When you look at it, it is actually dental hygienists who suffer from shoulder impingement the most. So imagine when you go to the doctor, or excuse me, when you go to the dentist and they're cleaning your teeth, how she's, um, the, the dental hygienist will be sitting in a chair and lifting that shoulder up all day long. And you have to lean over to be able to actually get to the person's mouth. So when you're doing that, you are protracting your shoulders as well as abduction. And that's putting a lot of stress right there on that supraspinatus. So you may have noticed the last time that you go to the dentist, that they are starting a trend right now because of all of the worksite injuries with dental hygienists of having the dental hygienist stand while they are actually performing the cleanings. Because if you're able to stand, you don't have to abduct that shoulder quite as much. So it's actually taking some of the risk out of it when they are standing to be able to clean the teeth instead of in that sitting position. And if they're not already standing, you might wanna educate your dentist and dent dental hygienist in that, you know, because I'd be willing to bet most dental hygienists that you will meet in your life have some kind of shoulder injury, have chronic pain or clicking or any of those combinements um, because it is the most diagnosed, uh, shoulder impingements, the most diagnosed in our dental hygienist. So something for you to think about and to consider and to realize. Now, this was a precursor to what we're going to be seeing when we are in injury prevention and management next term. So we'll actually be able to learn more in depth about these different injuries and then figure out ways to help rehabilitate somebody, what exercises will be good in order to help fix some of the issues. But I want you to make sure you are doing proper form and having good posture by contracting those rhomboids in our latissimus dorsi so that our back is contracted. And what that does is it pulls our scapula together and it retracts the scapula in order to open up that subacromial space so that we have more room for that supraspinatus muscle. I always love when I can bring baseball into my teaching. So let's take a look at the thrower's paradox. The thrower's shoulder must be lax enough to allow excessive external rotation, but stable enough to prevent symptomatic humeral head subluxation. Do you guys know what subluxation means? We'll take a look at it in just a second. Thus requiring a delicate balance between mobility and functional stability. So taking a look at a picture of our, of our pitchers in baseball, look at this external rotation. That is huge external rotation, right? When you're taking a look at it and the subluxation that is happening is a partial dislocation. So dislocation is when it completely jumps out of the socket, but a partial dislocation, we are taking a look at what's called a subluxation in which you actually are pulling a portion of that humeral head out of the glenoid cavity to be able to do this. So there's a huge demand on pitchers and they're very prone to shoulder injuries because of this movement that needs to happen in order to increase the speed on their throwing. So dislocation, what we have, you can see this is just normal right here on A and B, we're taking a look at a dislocation of the shoulder joint. When the ball comes completely outside of the socket, um, it can either be anterior or posterior. This one happens to be showing an anterior dislocation. 
And then in C, you can actually see where it is just a partial dislocation. The ball partially comes out of the socket and we call that a subluxation. <laughs> this is occurring when the bones are forced out of alignment. When we take a look at our um, uh, uh, dislocations and such or a subluxation, it's accompanied usually by strains and sprains. Strains are what happens to muscles. So you can strain a tendon or a muscle and then sprains are what happens to ligaments. So we get damage of the ligaments with our sprains and we get damage to muscles through strains. I like to remember that because strain has a T in it, like for tendons. So I know that's with the muscle versus a sprain is for the ligaments. It can also have fractures that can occur. There's a lot of inflammation in the area, and we will study inflammation in depthly in uh, injury prevention and management. Um, and then there's joint immobilization that can happen where it actually can become stuck and isn't able to move as fluidly as it once did. It can be caused by serious falls um, or common sports injuries that we have. And a subluxation is just that partial displacement of the joint instead of a complete dislocation. And this is very different when you have gone to perhaps a chiropractor and talked about vertebral subluxation. That's more of a historical concept um, that is used and it does not mean the same thing as what we're talking about here. So when you've got subluxation in the vertebral column, it is not saying that it is a partial disp displacement of the joint. It is something entirely different. So the shoulder accounts for almost half of all dislocations, right? Half of all dislocations. The shoulder is huge when it comes to dislocations. 95% of the time they're traumatic, meaning that it happens because of some kind of a trauma that's occurring. Not that it just all of a sudden happens because of a movement. Um, and as far as that direction of instability, 85% of the time it is an anterior dislocation, meaning the humeral head is going to pop out of that glenoid cavity and go anterior to the scapula itself. Some people can actually now do voluntary dislocations because they've had their shoulder dislocation uh, dislocated before. It's, um, some can do it. It's very rare to be able to do that though, uh, to be able to pop your shoulder. I don't advise it. Um, if that is something that you are able to do, um, there's a lot of damage that happens each time it comes in and out and possibility of blood vessels being uh, pinched, nerves being pinched. And so I wouldn't suggest doing it if you can, but it can happen. But here's a little picture we have. This is actually of a finger, right? But this is showing you the dislocation of it coming out of the socket. So you had the whole bone being dislocated. This one is a more of a posterior dislocation of the finger as it's coming out behind behind it. So here's an example. This is a 20-year-old male kayaking kayaker who had a shoulder dislocation. Um, and this is the picture of it prior to reduction. Reduction is when you put it back into place. Nothing that we will ever do, but it's done in the emergency setting, um, like in a hospital or a clinic setting. And what you can see is you can see this dislocation, it, there's deformity that's here in the picture of him itself. You'll also notice that this is his arm is propped up on a pillow. So when this anterior dislocation happens, it tends to pull that humeral head down. And you can see that in the x-ray itself, it pulls the humeral head down and anterior, and it makes it so that you can't move this joint as much. And so he's got the pillow propped and the blankets propped right here to kind of maintain this space and just take a little bit of the weight off of that humerus that we can see. So this is before the reduction, right? So this is before they've reset it back into place. Here we now can see after reduction. So it popped back into place. They applied traction, which is like pulling to try and loosen the muscles because everything is really tight in those muscles when it's dislocated. 
So they use this pulling feature called traction in order to replace it into where it needs to be. So you can see that it's still intact. Everything is good. Nothing was broken on this particular one, at least as far as fractures to the bone. I'd be willing to bet that there was some ligament damage and some muscle damage that we're not able to see here, but it all goes back into place nicely. All right, I got another question for you guys. Which of the following muscles attach to the scapula? So take a look over these options and give it your best guess. Hopefully you came up with it is all of the above. We actually have all of these ones that are listed above attaching to the scapula. So then the question is which muscles of the, protect, the pectoral girdle, right? The ones in this area do not attach to the scapula. So if you're looking up in your notes, hopefully you are able to see that the ones that are not attaching that are, can be found in this pectoral girdle area would be the pectoralis major and often the uh, latissimus dorsi. There are a couple of resources that might show that there is an attachment to the scapula for the latissimus dorsi, but in reality, um, most uh, resources will agree that it does not attach to the scapula itself. So we're looking at the latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis major. Ooh, what do we have here? Have you ever seen anybody like this? Where when they're doing push-ups, you can actually see the scapula accentuated right here. Hmm. Huh. This is called winging scapula. You might even have this, right? This one, you can see it a lot more um, pronounced here on her right side. You can see it a, a little bit maybe on her left, but really it's here on that right side. Most people will have it on both sides and it's usually a bilateral movement. But my question for you is, physical therapist is treating a patient with scapular winging, what we just saw in shoulder pain. Which muscle should she strengthen to reduce that scapular winging. So what is the muscle that is causing this? Well, in fact, it is the serratus anterior. So the serratus anterior attaches onto the medial border of that scapula and it pulls that scapula laterally forward, causing that inferior angle of the scapula to move anterior laterally, right? It's kind of got this anterior lateral movement to it, right? And so basically it is pulling in that scapula. How do we fix this? This is just a precursor to what we're looking at anatomy and physio, excuse me, injury prevention and management. But here is a picture of our serratus anterior right here. And it is attaching right here onto the scapula. Right, and uh, what you can do is called a push up plus. And so, what they'll do is actually do a push up and then they go a little bit further to work that serratus anterior. And you'll you actually see a little bit of a rounding of the back um, in between the shoulder blades that would come right here. Right here, they're just kind of um, taking a look at what the electrical impulses are that are happening, and they're measuring it in this research study. But when you do this push up and then you go a little bit further and so it ends up actually kind of like uh, protracting the shoulders just a little bit and it puts a little rounded amount um, in that area right in between the shoulder blades. So that's for our serratus anterior. We can do a push up plus. All righty, so we are gonna take a look moving down. So we started with the shoulder. Now we're gonna move just a little bit further down the arm. Let's see if we can palpate a few things. All right, let's see if we can find our greater and lesser tubercles. And you can actually feel the intertubercular or bicipital groove. Um, in between them. So try to see if you can feel that whole movement in there. So here we've got our greater tubercle and also can be called the greater tuberosity. Those are interchangeable. Then we have our lesser tuberosity or lesser tubercle. 
Um, I like to say tuberosity because it often means it's something bigger than just a tubercle, but that's just me personally. Um, it, they both can be used interchangeably. Occasionally, you might see somebody write trochanter, but uh, most resources will use trochanter to be left for the femur instead. All right, now feel down and find our lateral and medial epicondyles. Lateral and medial epicondyles. All right, so you should be feeling down here towards the elbow, right here. Which bone is this? This is our radius, which is on our thumb side. When we are in anatomical position is when is the best way for you to be able to find this, right? So on our thumb side here, right above it, on here on the humerus, you will have that lateral epicondyle. Here, what bone is that? That's our ulna. And our ulna is our medial side. So here is where you see that medial epicondyle. And the medial epicondyle will traditionally be much larger than what you see on the lateral side. That's another way to be able to look at it. Now, what happens if we actually have a fracture of the humerus? Transverse just means going across the middle of it. So you can actually see the break here where, right, where those arrows are coming through. Um, it is showing you that we end up having this portion will swing out, right? And then we will have this portion of the humerus will want to move in a superior motion whenever this fracture is happening, right? Basically what's happening are the biceps are kind of overriding what is happening. And so they're gonna contract whenever there's this fracture and it will actually pull this portion, this lower portion of the humerus itself up because of the contraction of the biceps right here, right? And then the deltoid will also want to contract where we have this on the deltoid tuberosity attaching right here, and it'll pull this into kind of an abducted motion as well. So you can just see like what happens when fractures happen, that the, the motions that will happen within the arm or the movements that will happen within the arm itself because of the contraction of the muscles in that area. And this is usually because of a direct blow to the arm of some sort. That's usually why you would get this transverse fracture of the humerus itself. Now, what would you think would happen if we have an avulsion of the greater tuberosity or the greater tubercle of the humerus. So remember, we've got a lot of attachments on this greater one. Specifically, we've got our supraspinatus and our infraspinatus, right? So you can see that attachment that's happening here around in that red circle where you can see it's highlighting that greater tuberosity or the greater um, tubercle right there, right? So if that were to become avulsed, meaning that it's pulled away from the humerus or torn off from it, what would still be attached to the humerus? Well, that would be the muscle here in the anterior. So if this were to be pulled off and away, we still would have the attachment right here. Do you remember what this muscle is right here? Here we have the subscapularis. So that would still be attached, right? So here we had the infraspinatus would rotate that muscle that way, right? But if it's not attached or it would rotate the bone that way to be more of that lateral rotation, right? But if that is no longer attached, but we still have the lesser tuberosity or lesser tubercle right here, we actually have that uh, subscapularis still attached. And so it will actually pull and medially rotate that humerus. So you can just see like what happens again, if there's damage, the muscles will contract, right? And then it'll actually perform those movements. So let's take a moment now and talk about movements of the shoulder. So what I want you to do is I want you to brainstorm first, okay? We're doing this just like we have before, in which I want you to, without notes, just from your memory of when you did your field guide, let's take a look and write down on a scratch piece of paper, which muscles contribute to, to concentric shoulder flexion, 
and which muscles contribute to concentric shoulder extension. So make a list of either one. After you have brainstormed your list, then what I want you to do is actually go back to your field guide itself and look up and see what ones you missed. Then when you are done, press play on the video again, and I will show you what I have from my research so that you can compare and contrast and can correct your field guide as we go. So when we look at our shoulder extension and flexion, so with our flexion, we should be seeing and listing down that the deltoid will help us with shoulder flexion as well as the pectoralis major, the biceps brachii, and the coracobrachialis. I love the name of the, cor of the coracobrachialis because it just seems so perfectly named. And that brachial is like that mid-region of what you have on your humerus. That's what it's called, the brachialis and the coraco because it's coming from the coracoid process. And it's just a perfectly little named uh, muscle that we have right there. So shoulder flexion is deltoid, pectoralis major, biceps brachii, and coracobrachialis. All right, for our extension, we've got the deltoid again, right? The deltoid, we're going to see this appear many times because it does uh, round out the whole shoulder and produces a lot of different movements. We also have the triceps brachii, the latissimus dorsi, and the teres major. Um, just to give you a little hint to help you remember is that the teres major, right? Not the minor, not the one that's part of the rotator cuff, but the teres major itself is considered the lat's little helper. So anything that the latissimus dorsi does, the teres major also does. So just remember that those two muscles are going to go together. We consider it the lat's little helper. So extension is our deltoid, our triceps brachii, latissimus dorsi, and teres major. Make sure you have corrected this on your field guide to match with this um, so that you can have that as a resource for you as we move on in the course. All right, question for you. Which of the following movements is the latissimus dorsi involved in producing? So take a look at these options and give it your guess. This is something that I would expect you to be able to know off the top of your head as we progress into the class and are doing it. But right now, you might need to look in your field guide to answer the question. We are looking at all of the above. So it does do shoulder extension a deduction and medial rotation. It's got a lot of movements associated with the latissimus dorsi. And then again, the teres major would do all of these things as well. All right, now let's do another list. So again, brainstorm first, write it down on a scratch piece of paper, then look up in your field guide and see what you missed. And then we're gonna come back and uh, press play on the video to compare it to what I have for my list. So for our abduction, abduction, there are only two muscles and we already talked about them. So hopefully you were able to recall this from earlier, but we've got the deltoid and the supraspinatus. Remember that supraspinatus is uh, just about 10% of that initial movement from anatomical position and then the deltoid will take over for that. For our adduction, we've got a lot more muscles to contribute here. So we've got the latissimus dorsi, which we just looked at in our previous question. We've got the pectoralis major, teres minor, subscapularis, infraspinatus, and then also as weaker contributors, we've got the teres major, the coracobrachialis, and the triceps brachii. So why do I separate and let you know about these different ones? So here, these ones that are, that are uh, not qualified as being weaker contributors, these major contributors are ones that I would expect for you to start memorizing. Uh, being able to know that the latissimus dorsi, the pectoralis major, the teres minor, subscapular, subscapularis, and infraspinatus lead to a deduction. The weaker contributors are ones I would not expect you to know off the top of your head, but to have in your notes so that you could look them up if needed. They're not the ones that con that contribute to the majority of those uh, movements, but they 
they do contribute. So I want you to have that in the back of your mind to be able to look up in your field guide. So which of the muscles would be tested during resisted lateral rotation of the shoulder? So which muscles would be tested for resisted lateral rotation, also known as external rotation of the shoulder? Good, so we've got the infraspinatus. So remember that infraspinatus contributes to that uh, lateral or external rotation. Remember the subscapularis is what's doing some of that medial rotation that we have. Uh, the supraspinatus doesn't do rotation at all. It's just responsible for the abduction of that humerus. All right, so let's talk about medial and lateral rotation also known as internal and external rotation, right? So you can say internal as medial or and external for lateral. Those are used interchangeably. First, again, let's go ahead and uh, brainstorm first, write them down on a piece of paper, then compare to your field guide and then come back and press play to compare to mine. So medial rotation, we've got the latissimus dorsi, subscapularis, teres major, because remember that teres major always goes with the latissimus dorsi, the pectoralis major, and a portion of the deltoid. So the deltoid also contributes to medial rotation. For lateral rotation, we've got the infraspinatus, the teres minor, our other rotator cuff muscle that's right underneath that infraspinatus, and a portion of the deltoid. So yes, there are portions of the deltoid that both medially and laterally rotate. So um, when you're just looking at it, just know it just depends on like which fibers. You don't have to memorize the types of fibers. I just want you to know that the deltoid both contributes to medial rotation and lateral rotation. So now taking what we've looked at so far, I want you to take an, a guess on when you look at the muscles that perform all these different movements that we talked about, and we take a look at the motion of circumduction. Now ask yourself, what is all involved in circumduction? Well, circumduction, right, has a period of shoulder flexion. It has an external rotation as well as an abduction. And then it has a medial rotation with an adduction coming back into flexion again. So when you're looking at these movements, is there a muscle that's listed here that contributes to a good portion of these different movements that we just talked about. So take a look, which of the following movements is primarily responsible for circumduction? Yes, if I were going to guess on this, I would look at the deltoid, right? Because it does so many of these different actions, right? It does flexion, it does extension, it does abduction, it does medial rotation, it does lateral rotation, right? So just taking a look at it, we've got the deltoid involved in so many different things. Everything pretty much except for adduction right? Everything but adduction. The deltoid does not tend to contribute to that, but all the other components, it does. All right, so I've got another question. This is one that I would expect you to have to answer by looking into your notes, or at least starting to understand that you want to start looking at them. Maybe you can get this without having to look at your notes yet, but we're looking at one of these clinical uh, clinical examples of questions. So your uncle who works in construction comes to you about a recent pain he's been experiencing in his shoulder. You perform range of motion testing, which reveals that active, passive, and resisted flexion, extension, and adduction is unaffected. However, active and resisted shoulder, you can call that humeral, abduction results in pain and weakness, but passive abduction is unaffected. So we're taking a look. What are the things we need to look at? First, I want you to take a guess, and then we're going to come back and talk about it.
All right, so when we're taking a look at this, we need to wade through the words, right? We need to wade through the words. And why do I do this? Because people are going to come to you. They are gonna come to you as their personal trainer and say, hey, when I'm doing this motion, my arm tends to hurt, or this is what's happening. And you've gotta wade through what they're saying to understand what they actually are telling you, if that makes sense. So what we're finding is that we've got a lot of things that are unaffected. Well, that's good to know. But what we do have affected is that active and resisted shoulder abduction is painful and weak. So when we're looking at it, painful and weak, we are looking at muscle, right? That's what we're looking at as far as it goes. So we're looking at our muscle right there. Now we need to take a look at this one. What specific structure do you think is injured? Now remember, I'm going to remind you right now that it is active and resisted abduction. Abduction is what's affected. So now we're looking for a muscle that does abduction. Let's look at it. Good, so we should be looking at none of the above because none of these muscles that are listed above contribute to abduction. What is it? Probably the supraspinatus or the deltoid because those are our two muscles that lead to abduction. All righty, so that's what I've got for you today. We're gonna come back and uh, look at further down the arm as we continue on. And just as a note, so you guys know, we have one lab left and we have one field guide left. We are in the home stretch, you guys. We are gonna make it. I'm so proud of you. Um, I'm just so proud of you. All righty, I will see you guys uh, next class.